So let's start. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining our panel discussion today. My name is Dr. Amin Zorgani and I am the founder of the Microbiome Mavericks and I will be your moderator today for this panel discussion. And without further ado, I would like to start by our panelists and ask them for an uh, introduction and going for the same order. Um, maybe Emma, you could introduce yourself for a quick two minutes, please. Sure. So uh, my name is Amaran Voko. I'm a, um, a PhD microbiologist. I'm uh, and also a molecular biologist based at the University of Guelph in Canada. Uh, that's near Toronto for anyone that doesn't know where Guelph is. Um, and um, I have been studying the gut microbiome for um, about 17 years now, uh, a little bit before it became sexy. Uh, so, um, so I have uh, uh, quite a lot going on in my lab, and um, and I guess my lab is best known for the the um, uh, development of something we call the Robo Gut, which allows us to culture microbes in vitro from the human gut and uh, to do nasty things to them in the bench that we would never do to humans, and be able to understand how microbiomes function that way. Fantastic, thank you, Peter. Please. Um, hi, I'm Peter Turnbaugh. I'm a professor in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology um, at the University of California in San Francisco. Um, and I think I've got a couple years on Emma. I, I started 19 years ago um, when I was a brand new grad student working in Jeffrey Gordon's lab at um, WashU in St. Louis. Um, and, you know, there did. Um, I was really fortunate in terms of being able to work on some of the early studies of the human and mouse microbiome. Um, with a focus on diet and obesity. Um, and our lab now continues to think about how the microbiome affects nutrition while also expanding into pharmacology. And so we think a lot about how the microbiome impacts how patients respond to treatment. Excellent. Thank you. James, please. Hi, everybody. Really nice to meet you all. Uh, I'm James Kinross. I'm a uh, clinical um, doctor by day. So I'm a colorectal surgeon and I predominantly treat bowel cancer. Um, and But I'm also an academic. So I did my PhD on the microbiome in 2005. And our group really tries to understand metabolic functions of microbes in the gut and how they cause cancer. But I'm also the PI on several FMT trials. Uh, and we're trying to engineer the microbiome to improve how cancer therapies work. So it's nice to be with you. Excellent. Thank you. Finally, Alan, please. Yeah, I am Alan Moss. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, which is a patient advocacy organization. Uh, prior to this role, I was Professor of Medicine and Gastroenterologist in Boston. And uh, coincidentally, I led the first U.S. clinical trial of FMT for Crohn's disease back in 2015. Excellent. And I think we'll be talking about FMTs today as also as one of our topics. And uh, to start this discussion, I really would like to maybe ask you, Peter, about um, more about the history of the microbiome. And, you know, uh, the first human microbiome project was like 2005 or 2007. And a lot of attention, you know, after that time uh, has brought up into the microbiome. However, only a few years just now, people or lay people started knowing or understanding about the microbiome. Can you maybe provide us with a, a history of when scientists first became aware of this organ, the microbiome? Yeah, I think James should probably answer this. I think he's the, <laughs> the most senior of us. I have 100% <laughs> no, <it's> like... <laughs> got the most um, senior. But um, yeah, no offense. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's really, you know, this field of study goes back to the beginning of microbiology. So, you know, uh, many of you have probably heard of Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek, who was the inventor of the microscope. And, you know, one of the first things he did when he had a microscope was look at the microbiome. Um, so I think microbiologists have always appreciated that microbes are kind of part of the body where we live our whole life in contact with microbes and, um, and they have uh, many important uh, roles. Um, I think the, the field of microbiology for, for many years was, you know, just due to the lack of tools um, you know, had to take a very reductionist approach and so, you know, was focusing on single microbes that uh, there was a, if you, any of you have read the book, The Microbe Hunters, uh, there's this uh, fascinating history of people trying to find microbes that cause all sorts of different diseases in humans as well as other animals. Um, and so that was kind of the predominating school of thought that there, there would be single or, 
organisms that are really important for a given disease. Um, and that was true for many, you know, the classic infectious diseases, um, but, you know, hasn't really panned out for chronic disease. And so, you know, we, no one's been able to find a microbe, single microbe that causes obesity or that causes colitis. Um, and so I think over the last maybe 15, 20 years, there's been this shift towards thinking about how complex microbial communities, so how do many, many microbes that are found together in different sites in the body work together to either cause disease or, or influence how the disease progresses and is ultimately treated. So that's really been the recent, I think, shift in how we think about microbes and their role in pathophysiology. Excellent, thank you. And I think uh, one of also what the notions that at least that is still being debated until today is um, the notion of a healthy microbiome, because a lot of people ask, okay, th there is a human who is healthy, so we know what a human is healthy, but what is a healthy microbiome? And that's maybe a, a question to you, James. Yeah, just just um, kind of picking up on uh, Peter's comment. So Antoine van Nernhoek actually studied his own feces with his early microscopes to work out what was in there. So he was obviously interested in the fecal microbiome before anybody knew what it was. So I think it, to, uh, the, the question you ask is absolutely fundamental. And um, I don't have a good answer for you, but I'll, but I'll explain why I don't have a good answer for you. So if you go back to the first really large attempts to try and map the human microbiome, um, the health of the microbiome is pretty def pretty much defined by an ecological construct. So basically, who is there? Do you have enough of the right types of bugs uh, in the right proportion to represent uh, a healthy microbiome? And the question was asked, well, is there a standard microbiome between people that, that we can identify that is consistent? And, and the one thing that we've really learned from microbiome research in the last 20 years is that it's enormously variable between individuals, uh, certainly at a strain level. Now, there might be core functions that the microbiome contains to allow us all to live healthy, normal lives, but actually, ecologically, it's quite variable. The second thing you have to probably know about the microbiome to answer that question is that it's dynamic at certain points in our time, uh, in, our, in, our, in our lives. So in our early life, as it develops, it's quite dynamic, or, and then it becomes relatively stable after about the age of five into adult life. Uh, and then it sort of becomes a little more unstable as you get older. So asking when a microbiome is healthy is a really important part of that question. It's not just, you know, um, uh, um, who is there, it's what they're doing, but it's also when they're doing it. Uh, and for conditions like Crohn's disease, for example, it might be really, really important what happens to the microbiome in its early development in early life, rather than what's actually happening when Crohn's has already manifested itself later in life, uh, if you really want to understand why Crohn's happens and, and, and what's underlying it. So, so the answer is, is that we, I certainly in, in the field that I work, which is in cancer, we, we don't really know what a normal uh, or healthy microbiome is. And that's important because it plays into the language of microbiome science. So you'll hear a lot of people use the word dysbiosis. So dysbiosis means, you know, an abnormal state of the microbiome associated with a, a particular pathological condition. The problem with that word is it doesn't necessarily imply causation and it doesn't necessarily imply that we know what a healthy microbiome is. Uh, and it's for us, it's a major, major issue because if we want to try and standardize microbiome science or you want to have microbiome targeted therapy, it would be kind of helpful to know what a healthy microbiome is. And so ultimately a healthy microbiome is individualized. It's, it's for that specific person uh, and, it's, and it's a time dependent phenomenon and it probably has a functional component to it that allows the microbiome to be resistant or resilient in the face of environmental changes like dietary changes or antibiotics or other medicines that we have. I think also there is uh, one debated question that was I think recently published by some folks from the APC is whether you're born with the gut microbiome or does it develop over time? What are the thoughts there, Emma? Um, so yeah, so I think that um, the uh, for a little while there was some controversy in the field about this and there was uh, some work that was done that seemed to suggest that there might be some small level of um, colonization of the gut before birth, I think, um, or of the body before birth. But I think that's pretty much been shown to be not the case and likely the reason that we saw those results was uh, was sequencing error because this is incredibly difficult sequencing to do. So no fault of the researchers that did it. Uh, so I think that um, really we need to um, appreciate that uh, you pretty much, if you're a healthy infant, uh, you're born sterile. 
Uh, but during the process of birth is when you first come into contact with the microbes that uh, that really come from your mother's um, vagina, from the birth canal, or from her skin if you are delivered through a C-section. And then that uh, microbiome is actually helped by uh, your body uh, through uh, breast milk and through other things to uh, to develop uh, uh, sp in a specific way. Uh, so certain microbes start to colonize and then other ones are able to come in. Um, and that process can, you know, takes uh, takes a little while, but uh, but you are not born um, colonized. So you you are colonized by the microbes that are from your mother, obviously, but also from the environment that you find yourself in. And as you develop, uh, that environment is very different for very different people. And this is probably underpinning the reason why everyone has a slightly different gut microbiome. And once you've reached the age of around between three and five years, your microbiome and your immune system learn to work together and your immune system or your, your uh, microbiome becomes um, pretty um, uh, sort of uh, homeostatic. Uh, it's a, that's the wrong word to use because that implies that it doesn't change and that's not true, it does change. Um, but it, um, it doesn't change uh, very much and um and really um becomes part of you you know so so we actually at one point we're calling it a poo print like a fingerprint so it's uh the, the types of microbes that would be present there uh would be unique to you and then that microbiome um with a few exceptions because you know obviously you you have a few um uh, things which happen to you through life, you might take antibiotics, you might take other drugs, uh, but that microbiome pretty much stays with you um, in in a certain form. It's very difficult to do these kinds of studies. You you will um, you, you must understand, but uh, but it does kind of stay with you um, uh, uh, for pretty much for your whole life, with a few changes towards the uh, towards around puberty and then you know towards the end of life. Listen, I think uh, so. Because this microbiome uh, and it's there is an importance about it and there is a role that it plays and, and uh, several studies have shown already that um, reduced in a diversity at least from the gut microbiome perspective can cause certain diseases or can be a consequence or a correlation or association with those diseases and one of them is uh, Crohn's and colitis uh, disease. So maybe a question to you, Peter: How? Or what we know today about the role of the microbiome to play in or the root root cause of Crohn's disease? Yeah, or maybe uh, this is a better question for Alan. Than... <laughs> Alan, I, I, I think I said, I yeah. Think, I, I guess one thing, oh, did you say, Alan? Yeah, no worries, but uh, so um, please go ahead, Alan. I, yeah, I think I can, uh, you can definitely clarify, comment. I think, it, you know, one concept that's important for people to realize is kind of the framework in which we establish causal causality in humans. And so, you know, for microbes, you know, unlike the human genome, there's not really a framework for saying that, you know, I observed something about the microbiome of a human. And so now I know it causes disease. We can do that for the human genome because it's more or less stable over our lifetime, um, which is not true for the microbiome. Um, and so, uh, you know, this was established long ago by a German scientist, uh, Robert Koch, and, uh, you know, he proposed that the, the really the way to establish causation is to take microbes out of humans and put them into an animal model. And if the, if the animal model gets sick, then you can, with some degree of confidence, infer that the microbe was important for disease in a human. And so, you know, that's kind of the process that has now happened for many diseases, including Crohn's and colitis and others. So, um, you know, we essentially do an FMT from a human <laughs> into a mouse and then see if we can make the mouse um, develop symptoms of the disease that we observe in a human patient. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. Uh, then, Alan, please, if you, if you can add a little bit more on our clinical perspective and what we, we know today from a microbiome influence on the, the Crohn's disease. Yeah, I think what we know is that if you take a patient with established Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis and measure the microbiome, it looks different to a healthy population. And so there's an association there. What's not clear, is it different because of the inflammation or do they have Crohn's because they have a different microbiome from the start? Um, and that's where some of these studies are mentioned about antibiotics and changes in early lifestyle factors, how they might influence future developments. If you take children uh, very soon after diagnosis, so before treatment for any major influences, 
already at that point, their microbiome is generally different in terms of families and species than uh, other individuals. But again, have they had subclinical inflammation for a long time that's caused that? Or is that the first hit on their physiology? So that is, I think, still to be determined. Excellent. Uh, and I think one of the words that you've mentioned also, Peter, is FMT. And I think just maybe to give a little bit of, of what is FMT, so fecal microbiota transplantation. And I mean, any of you, Alan, Peter, or Emma, if you could answer uh, or maybe clarify on how far back is this fecal microbiota transplantation existed? And we do know that it exists today, but uh, was it a long time ago uh, that people started practicing this? Because we do know about the microbiomes a long time ago. I think uh, James will probably appreciate it. In the modern era, it came from surgeons. Uh, in, in the 1950s, some surgeons noticed that there were <laughs> patients with severe C. diff after surgery, and they gave them fecal enemas to try and treat the C. diff. Uh, and but that was really a, a, a very niche area of clinical practice until around the late 90s, 2000s, when there really the, was a huge increase in the incidence of C. diff, both in hospitalized patients and the community. And the antibiotics at the time, metronidazole, weren't preventing relapses. So many patients are coming back for their second, third, fourth episode. And that's really where this idea of introducing healthy uh, bacteria from a healthy person to someone with C. diff came along. I will say that certainly my opinion that transplantation is a bit of a misnomer. It's not like a liver transplant or a cornea transplant. This is not like a permanent replacement of one microbiome with the other. It's probably closer to a blood transfusion where you're transiently shifting things towards normal physiology, but it's not a permanent wholesale change of someone's microbiome. But I'm interested to see what the panel think of that. Yeah, I think what's fascinating is that, it, you know, it actually goes back way farther than the 20th century. So the, the original, you know, uh, written recording of FMT goes back to 6 BC. So and, um, it's an incredibly old practice that had, you know, had been used in ancient China for many years. And what's fascinating to me is that a lot of the experiments that are still being done now to kind of optimize how we prep it, how we deliver it, and um, these other questions um, were also done in ancient China. <laughs> and so they, you know, they sort of immediately realized like, oh, what happens? You know, maybe we can try it. Maybe it would be better to ferment it outside the body. So, uh, you know, a lot of these are old questions. I think what's different now is that we have the ability to, to sequence and understand what the microbes are in the, in the, in the uh, FMT, which is something that they couldn't do because they didn't have any methods at the time to look at the microbes. So I think it's fascinating because if if the FMT is you know going back to the you know the Chinese medicine and the yellow soup as they used to call it, uh, and the, I think the film reinforced the fact that there is over four hundred research uh, clinical trials that study the FMT on various conditions, going from Crohn's to C diff, which is one of probably the most uh, known, and to even autism. Why the sudden interest that we have seen today about FMT? Uh, maybe Emma can answer that question. Uh, the sudden interest in FMT. Well, I think that there um, were some uh, big gains in FMT therapy in terms of uh, C. difficile infection, and then that that was where it was obviously uh, very effective and and shown to be um, uh, again for these patients who had severe recurrent C. difficile infection. Um, and then the, uh, at the same time, there was this sort of general um, realization by people that the microbiome is important. And that's, a, that's quite a, an important thing to stress, because before that, we used to think of microbes as generally bad things that are worth getting rid of because they tend to cause disease. Because the, the, before the microbiome research really came along, there was relatively little microbial ecology research and certainly very little in terms of the, um, the human body. And so most of the microbiology research that was done in that era was done on infectious disease. And that kind of shaped our idea of microbes are bad. Uh, antibiotics are good. We need to get rid of microbes to make us healthy. And so clearly C. difficile infection is in a situation where that doesn't happen. And in fact, in that case, on most of the cases of uh, recurrent C. difficile have their roots in, a, in, a, in a, a treatment with an antibiotic or something that really changed uh, the microbiome and perhaps removed a lot of the microbes that were present. And so, um, so yeah, so I think that um, 
that FMT is is sort of reached the the psyche of people, and and then movies like uh, designer designer shit like this one are sort of uh, showing that it's not necessarily just important or just uh, useful therapy for C. difficile infection, but perhaps could be used for a number of other uh, situations which have their root cause in uh, in an altered or, or, or damaged or, or less diverse microbiome. The jury's still out on, on many of those, but I think that the, the clinical research that's being done is certainly pointing towards there being a uh, potential use for it. I think the biggest problem with FMT is that it's a very crude therapy, right? We're using poop as medicine. And I think that there are better ways of really doing that. And part of the issue is that we don't really understand what the microbes are necessarily doing. And we're getting a lot better at that now. Uh, but um, but there has been some recent work that's sort of shown that you can take some of some of my work, for example, we can actually take microbes and purify them and, and mix them together and, and utilize that to treat seal infection. So you don't need the whole of the micro of the of the poop sample, if you like. Um, but then that begs the question, well, which microbes are good? And, and you know, we're still not being able to answer that <laughs> uh, uh, effectively. You know, that's a very complicated question, as it turns out. Uh, but there's also been some other studies where they've even been able to take just the metabolites. So these are just the, the, the things that the microbes are making. So that just the metabolites from a stool sample can also, in some cases, provide some therapeutic relief. Uh, to some patients. And again, we don't really know why. Uh, they, these are sort of big questions that we're trying to sort of answer in the lab. Um, in my lab, we're very interested in bacteriophages, which is actually the, the viruses that affect bacteria. And we think that uh, in some cases, they may be behaving as messengers of changing, you know, moving genes around and changing expression profiles in bacteria so that they uh, they change the way they behave. Yeah, I, I think the, that's the science is so um, advancing, yeah. Go ahead, Peter. Well, I think like one thing that's really important to make clear, uh, uh, you know, I guess I disagree with Emma in that the, I think a lot of the focus in the microbiome field is still on microbial pathogenesis. It's just we're doing it for mixtures of microbes instead of single or uh, organisms. And this is certainly true for colitis, where, you know, many different members of the gut microbiota have been found that exacerbate colitis in mouse models. And so, you know, I think a lot of these FMT clinical trials are, you know, they're taking a very superficial view of the microbiome where they're, you know, they think that any the FMT will always be beneficial regardless of the disease. And that, that's really unclear whether or not that's the case. It could be for a lot of diseases. And we're starting to see some of this coming from trials and psoriasis and other diseases where the results are negative um, in, in terms of the FMT causing problems. Um, uh, you know, for a given disease, it might actually be worse to have an FMT. And so you might want to take the opposite approach and start removing microbes from the community. And so I, I think it's really unclear that FMT is going to be kind of a, a fix for all diseases. Can I can I add into that? So I think um, you asked the question, why is FMT popular? Like, right? why is it suddenly so popular now? So I think that the answer requires a little bit of context. So the first context is that you have to, in terms of microbiome science, basically 20 years ago, we discovered a new organ. And it turns out this organ is important for lots of different chronic disease states. And FMT has been used as an experimental system, just like Peter explains, you know, to study how the microbiome works since actually, you know, we first had germ-free models. We've been doing it for, for a long time, right? And actually, this is all Peter's fault because it was his work <laughs> that, in obesity that, demonstrated that when you when you perform an FMT, the 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 consequences may be may be quite startling and they may be very unexpected. So whether it's changing obesity phenotypes or it's changing behavioral uh, um, uh, you know behaviors in animals. And and what it basically said is is that there is a there is a there is a gap in our medical understanding of how many chronic diseases are caused and how they may be treated, and that the microbiome might be a really important mediator in explaining that. And when you started to have FMT trials that started to work beyond FMT, uh, sorry, beyond Clostridium difficile, um, patients became extremely excited by that because they are often being failed by, mod by modern medical therapies. And like Crohn's and colitis is a really good example. We've got really good drugs. We've got biological treatments that work, but many patients are really, really suffering and, th and they're desperate for cures and for solutions. And it became, in, you know, it became therefore very attractive to try FMT trials. And the more FMT trials you did, the more, um, the more, 
popularity and, and, and more, sorry, the more popular um, they became. And, and I would argue that 400 trials isn't very many trials, actually, globally. Uh, and in a recent survey of European uh, studies, there's only about 1800 transplants done in patients. I would say it's still a niche in an early, uh, at, at an early phase. And th those trials are very poorly standardized. standardized often of very variable quality, often with almost no clinical primary outcome measures or mechanisms that are being uh, that have hypotheses which are being tested. And they're being done in almost kind of feasibility. We've got like a pilotitis, like a feasibility contagion of, of these studies that are being done in, in small ways that are not having the power and the impact that we really need for them to have. So, so I think there's a sort of supply demand challenge. I think there's a height curve. I think there's a um, you know, a genuine excitement and well-placed interest in the role of the microbiome. But but we are at a really early stage. Like this is still early science and you've got to give it a little bit more time, I think. Jason, I think you wrote a book about the microbiome, right? Dive matter. And um, so when you tell or you speak about, I mean, it, I had a personal experience when people asked me about the microbiome and I say, listen, having a healthy microbiome that's good for, for you, as a, a person and it's for your life for your you know your health in general uh but it's like people tell me listen i don't see those microbes what should i care really how, how do you answer these kind of people i mean what, what would you tell them about the significance of microbes in their lives health um well i mean first of all you get 10 percent. so thank you for mentioning that <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you. um so look what, what i would say is is that um uh, actually, I think it's the opposite. I think many of my patients now come and see me with usually a, a big stack of data that they've got from some, you know, consumer testing website, uh, and they want me to explain it to them is actually what's happening. And that's often very difficult. Uh, and I think we uh, as clinicians need to be doing much more to be bringing microbiome analysis into routine clinical practice. Uh, and at the moment, we really lack fundamental standards and um, processes for doing that robustly. Uh, and for educating clinicians in how to use that information meaningfully to both um, influence therapy or perhaps even to prognosticate or to uh, or stratify treatment. Uh, and I think you're starting to see international shifts now that are beginning to do that. Uh, trying to educate patients, uh, in my experience, I have to say, I think m many of my patients are very happy to learn about their biology and want to understand much more about the microbiome. Uh, and I don't really have a problem, actually, at the moment with trying to convince people that bugs are important. But I would come, okay. um, come back to Emma's point, right, is actually it's not the patient that's often the problem, it's the clinician. And I say that as a clinician. And that's because we're mired in a 19th century way of thinking, which is based on Robert Cox postulates or, you know, um, this sort of idea that all bugs are bad. Uh, all bugs are not bad. Uh, um, but, you know, some can be bad if you don't treat them right, right? And we're not very good at treating our symbionts in a particularly sympathetic manner. Uh, and so actually it's about educating clinicians about that and, and giving them tools to meaningfully leverage the microbiome in the way that they treat patients uh, and, and trying to do really good quality science. Because unless we give them the data and the really good quality trials that demonstrate therapeutic benefit or, you know, are transparent in some of the failings of these FNT interventions, as Peter's, you know, rightly brought up, then we're not going to push forward. And uh, I think uh, one of also the topics that also uh, points to the microbiome is what does influence the microbiome and what are, and how these microbiomes actually change. Maybe Emma, you could clarify that kind of uh, question on the influencers uh, on the microbiome itself? Oh, uh, yeah, okay. So, well, that's a big question because there's many things that it turns out influence the microbiome and perhaps Peter can uh, talk about some of the drug stuff for sure. Mm -hmm. um, they, the, one of the biggest drivers is diet. Uh, I think we can all agree that the Western diet is is perhaps not as beneficial as it could be. Uh, the microbes in our guts tend to be, or the beneficial ones tend to be sacrolytic, and that means that they break down sugars. And they're not breaking down simple sugars like uh, candy and sweets and things. They're actually breaking down complex sugars, which would be fibers and uh, and and other forms of um, you know very complex. Um, uh, fibers that we get from our diet. So this is kind of the genesis of where we sort of hear that we should be eating five vegetables a day or five portions of vegetables a day. Uh, it's because these uh, vegetables and fruits are by far the, the biggest um, contributors of these kinds of foods to our diet. 
but not many of us do that. And I think, you know, one of the things that we do in our lab is we study hunter-gatherer peoples. And if you look at their microbiomes, their microbiomes are extremely more diverse than ours. They have different microbes, uh, that's fair to say, and they've got very different uh, situations. But we think that one of the biggest drivers there is the diet. Because if you look at the diet of these hunter-gatherer peoples, they're eating far more fiber than we ever uh, would even consider possible in the Western world or in the urbanized world, I should say. And so so, so so diet is one thing. And then perhaps I'm going to pass it over to, to Pete to talk about the drugs, because I think he's done a lot of work on that. And I think that's very important, too. Yeah, I think <clears throat> I definitely think, you know, the two the two things at the top of my list are diet and drugs, um, which are conveniently the two things we study. <laughs> uh, maybe that's why they're on my list. Um, but, the, um, you know, I think we touched on this a little bit. So C. diff infection, you know, C. diff is this really nasty um, um, bacteria that infects the gut and uh, what you know the reason why FMT has been successful for that is that the uh, C. diff is taking advantage of the damage that's been caused to the normal members of the gut microbiome um, by broad spectrum antibiotics and so you know that's uh, I think we don't fully appreciate many of us both in the scientific and, and clinical research community you know, how every time you take an antibiotic, you're not you're not just getting rid of whatever the um, target is, but you're there's this off target effect on the microbiome. Um, and what's been surprising is that, that that's actually not just true for things that are labeled antibiotics. It's true for many drugs that are used in medicine. So the anti-inflammatory drugs like methotrexate um, also act like an antibiotic. Um, cancer chemotherapies uh, have, you know, similar antibiotic-like effects on the microbiome. Um, and so, you know, the kind of scope of the effect of drugs on microbes is is enormous. And this is especially important because, you know, uh, you know, I think the stats are that, like, the average American is taking at least one drug at a given time. And so, you know, we're basically all medicated. <laughs> Um, you know, some of those drugs won't change the microbiome, so, you know, maybe we don't need to worry about it, um, but many of them will. And so, you know, I think we need to understand more about you know, kind of what the key classes of drugs are that matter and, and then what the consequences are of those effects. Can, can, I, can, I, come in there, can I come in yeah. there as well? So, so I think um, I, I, I would absolutely second everything or third everything that's been said. I mean, the scale of antibiotic misuse is is extraordinary and and i think you also have to put that in an evolutionary time scale right so you've really got to remember i work well actually i work at samaris hospital in london which is where alexander fleming you know made his discovery right in 1928 and um you know we now prescribe 38 billion daily doses of antibiotics globally and the distribution of antibiotic use is not even it's actually growing in low and middle income countries where it's less well regulated and so india and china as well are having these huge mm. economic booms that's where the majority of prescribing is coming and it's also happening in kids more frequently during a covid pandemic antimicrobial prescribing went up it didn't go down and it will keep going up for a bit as a result of that in fact you know since i think 2025 to, between 2000 and 2015 antibiotic prescribing went up by 65 percent and the majority of antibiotics are not given in to humans they're given to animals right and actually antibiotics were used historically as growth promoting factors in farming practices uh, so 80 percent of all antibiotic use is not actually given to humans it's given to the food to the animals that we need to maintain our food supply and that's a huge problem so since the second world war what you've seen is uh, a massive growth in, po in population you know from 2 billion to 8 billion you've seen the urbanization of population you've seen fundamental changes in the way that we consume and, and use drugs foods and, and antibiotics. Uh, and then also you've seen global migration. And these things basically are fundamentally altering our internal ecology. And a different way of conceptualizing this is that you think about an external climate crisis. Most people understand this, right? Most people understand the planet's getting hotter and we're losing global diverse ecosystems that are important for maintaining global health. Well, the microbiome connects us to those systems, it, it both literally and figuratively. And the same crisis is happening with and on us and it's happening within that same time frame and that's why uh, Alan has a job at the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation it's why you know immune mediated diseases are rising rapidly globally and they're doing that in parallel not just in the gut you know they're doing it systemically it's why we have this 
chronic burden of non-communicable diseases that imprisons typically young people, not in diseases that are going to kill them like it did in Louis Pasteur's time or Robert Koch's time, when a lot of the kind of microbiology legends were needed to treat infectious disease. It's treating them in non-communicable chronic diseases. And so the reason we're having a panel meeting today is because the microbiome is a fundamental mediator of that chronic disease risk. And that's why FMT is happening, because we've got no way to unpick that complexity. And the only solution is to have feces from someone that's possibly healthy to try and reset the microbiome and to reset the immune system. So, so these are really complex, um, complex um, answers that, that don't have a nice, simple, well, it's just too much, you know, it's you're having, you know, too much sugar in your diet. It's not quite that simple. I think there's something happening that's a little bit more um, uh, complex. And just to emphasize, you, Alan, maybe go ahead. Yeah. Just to emphasize James point there, I think I think the summary there is we've got far more data about the microbiome than we have solutions to change it. Absolutely. And, and I think, uh, you know, the more we're learning, uh, the, the better we can get better solutions. And obviously, probably in 2017, we did not have, you know, uh, better uh, metagenomic uh, tools that enable us to go faster and, and deeper in the sequencing of this microbiome. And uh, I think the time will allow us to, um, you know, and solve some of the questions. However, the microbiome stay and probably will first stay for a little bit of time a complex question however i would just like maybe to add some of the questions that were asked on the chat uh, re regarding this topic what influences the microbiome a uh, question from karen uh, what is the impact of artificial sweeteners uh, on the microbiome like uh, aspartame for instance another question from kelly uh, about the environmental toxins affecting the microbiome maybe some aspartame and environmental toxins yeah, I think both both of those topics are really interesting. They're, they're great questions. Um, they've not been worked on a lot. There's a little bit of data suggesting that artificial sweeteners might matter. Some sweeteners, um, mostly saccharin. Um, aspartame, does, as far as I know, does not have that much rigorous data um, looking at the microbiome effects. Um, and so, you know, each sweetener is really different. Um, there's actually very old data looking at cyclamate, which is a sweetener that's still in the UK, but but was banned in America. And I think that that has a pretty clear link to the microbiome and that it can be metabolized into cyclohexamine, which is a toxic compound. Um, so yeah, it, it, you really have to think about the specific compound that you're um, talking about. And they're, uh, you know, each of these, you know, the artificial sweeteners are kind of lumped together because they, they're all sweet, <laughs> but they're actually not the same chemicals or, or even related chemicals. And so you, you need to, um, we need to do more to understand each of them. And then I think environmental toxins are, you know, that's a huge catch all of many different diverse compounds and it's really lagged behind where we're at in terms of thinking about the drugs that are used in um, medical practice. So. Um, I don't know, maybe others can talk about what they've seen in the environmental toxicology, but um, I, I think there's a lot more to do in terms of unpacking it. I guess I did I did want to return to James's point. Like, I disagree with the, the claim that we don't have tools to unpack the microbiome. I think we do. Um, and, you know, as you, Amin was referring to, you know, we on what, you know, we go back 20 years, we didn't even know what was in the gut. Um, so, that, you know, we, we were just describing what is found. And so we've gone from that, like, very basic understanding to now really sophisticated tools for understanding causation and mechanism. And, you know, we can do genetics in many organisms. We can build synthetic communities. You know, Emma has pioneered a lot of this stuff. So, you know, we have, you know, great tools in the basic science arena to kind of, you know, go from complex microbial communities to identify key drivers, mechanisms. And I think what's lagged is kind of translating that knowledge uh, into medical practice. We, you know, we're still doing FMT, which is the same thing we were doing in ancient China. We haven't kind of updated the medical tools that we have to intervene in patients. And uh, Alan, maybe this question also to you from um, uh, Karen uh, Toscos. Um, she says that I'm a victim of overuse of antibiotics from um, uh, the medical field and I am desperate need of an FMT. The question is, 
how do we as patients accelerate the FDA to approve this for a broader audience? Well, so the, from an FMT perspective, you know, the FDA has what it calls enforcement discretion for individuals who have C. diff to get an FMT from a, uh, a physician they know to prescribe it or to help them coordinate that. Um, but in terms of widespread use, um, there are two FDA approved products for, for current C. diff that are based on originally from donor stool samples and, and now are grown in the lab or, or, or cultured in the lab. So there are that pathway for C. diff has, has been developed and is ongoing. For inflammatory bowel disease, it's far more behind. There are some products that are in phase one or phase two clinical trials to um, assess their role, but that's as far as they've gone. And so that's for much earlier in the step, but there are various steps along the way for both IBD and C. diff that are either approved or in the process of being assessed at least for approval. When do we should expect like this kind of therapies? How long would these patients would need to wait for? Well, I mean, for the C. diff, they're already available in the United States. Uh, for IBD, you know, phase one to phase two, that takes five to 10 years. And that assumes that then the product actually is both safe and effective. And they're the two thresholds to for the FDA to approve something. And then I think there's also a question to you, uh, Alan, maybe a follow-up. Uh, um, uh, what are your thoughts on the use of emulsifiers on insulative colitis and Crohn, like cellulose gum, uh, carboxy, uh, methyl cellulose gum, uh, carrageen gum, and polysorbate 60 and 80? Eliminating these items of your, uh, if you have IBD, that's what uh, the question is about. Um, so not all those specific ones I have information on. I mean, in general, the diet impacts your microbiome and your microbiome may or may not impact your, your inflammatory bowel disease. There are lots of clinical trials of excluding things from your diet in, for example, Crohn's disease and showing some short-term effects. Um, but I don't have answers on those specific items individually. Yeah, I think they're probably referring to the, you know, Andrew Gewirtz said some, a series of studies where he was um, looking at emulsifiers and mass models of colitis and and they definitely saw effects. I think, I don't remember or recall offhand whether or not they kind of used a treatment model. So, I mean, I guess one thing that many people <laughs> in the meeting might not be aware of is, you know, a lot of times when we model disease in mice, we're looking at pathogenesis. So we're looking at change something early and then the disease gets worse. Um, we actually do less, there's a lot less in the literature in terms of inducing disease and then doing treatment experiments. And so, you know, those kind of like removing emulsifier hypothesis, um, I, I think probably hasn't been tested, but you know, that's something you could easily do. You, you know, we have a lot of models where you could, um, you know, look at colitis and then see whether or not taking away the emulsifier does something. It, it's sort of unclear whether or not it will, if you, you know, if you sort of pass the tipping point and the disease, you know, you can no longer rescue disease with, with diet. I think there were some attempts, you know, uh, regarding artificial sweeteners and emulsifiers and their impact on the gut microbiome, but uh, I haven't seen, you know, a very serious big clinical trial that basically li linked the, the, the use of emulsifiers on the gut and then the, dis the development of disease. So, uh, but yeah, I think, I, I, the, I think there's been some work on, I, I think there was some guys in Michigan maybe looking at xanthan gum and, and, and rheumatococci, as I recall. But so I think there has been some work in trying to understand some of the network effects that these additives have on the microbiome, but then causally linking them to a, a disease is, is still, I think, um, the jury is still out on that. I think what you have, if you look at the clinical literature, you've got a divide. You've got meta-analyses and epidemiological studies that seem to suggest an association, but we lack the molecular mechanism that links them. Uh, it's intuitive to me that if you put, you know, tons of these uh, uh, ultra-processed fruit ingredients into a community that's going to have some sort of health impact, but we don't know precisely what it is. I think it is also worth just representing the flip side of that coin, which is that particularly in the cost of living crisis, you know, food is very expensive. 
uh, and it's difficult to access. And we in the UK have people at food banks that can't afford to eat. And these emuls these emulsifiers and these these you know additives they make food cheap and they make food accessible. So you know the the microbiome revolution you know has got to give sustainable solutions to people to eat affordably and to be able to protect their gut at, at the same time. And that's a that's a policy problem. It's a regulatory problem, right? So, so a key a key part of the microbiome um, work that's being done by many of the members of this panel and others around the world has to be to inform, has to be to inform health policy. And I think the key gift of the microbiome is actually in disease prevention. It's about stopping you getting Crohn's in the first place, right? <laughs> Rather than treating it after the horse has bolted. Uh, and that's the thing that I'm most excited about with it. Yeah, I think related to this, like, it, yeah, we've been working a lot in our lab on excipients, which are, um, you know, everyone, I don't know, <laughs> next time you go and buy your medicine, <laughs> just for fun, you might want to read the label more carefully. They, you know, so if you buy, you know, an antihistamine or something, it'll have the active ingredient, which is the drug you're trying to buy. And then there's a huge paragraph of what are called excipients. And, and that's actually what makes up the pill. And so those are things like food colorings, you know, it could be a, um, emulsifiers, binding agents, sometimes it's things like starch. And all of these are kind of added in with your drug. Um, and, it, you know, current the current kind of policy regulation is that you ignore all those things. <laughs> uh, you know, they're kind of assumed not to matter, um, but it turns out many of them have important interactions, both with the host and with the microbiome, and they can change how drugs move through the body. And so it might actually explain why patients report that if they have, you know, if they buy a generic pill versus the original pill, they see different outcomes. So, yeah. Absolutely. And I think it does make sense. Uh, and uh, a lot of uh, some of those exceptions, a few of them, you can even find them in the petrol industry, right? So I think um, what matters is that, it's, it's, I mean, if you eat one uh, junk food a, a month, maybe that's okay. But the repeated use of some of the junk food, um, I think that what causes the issue usually uh, is how much you eat of that uh, bad things. Um, uh, Emma, you've mentioned uh, the hunter gatherers and the diversity. And I think some of the questions also comes back is this loss of microbiome diversity, is it localized to some uh, populations or some ethnicities or is it like a global issue that we are facing today? Um, I would say that um, that when you you take a, a population and and you change the lifestyle lifestyle as um, as much as urbanization has changed lifestyle over a relatively short space of time if we're thinking about evolutionary terms you're going to see changes in microbiome and some of those changes might be beneficial changes that allow that person who's now in this environment to cope with being in that environment so when i say that uh, you know that the biggest question that i get asked is well can i just take some hunter gatherer microbes and colonize my gut and i would say that's a really bad idea because you don't eat a diet that is similar to that of a hunter gatherer and you don't live a lifestyle that is similar to that of a hunter gatherer. So you can't expect your microbes to be providing you what you need. So while we do see that there are missing microbes as they're called, some um, microbes that we never see in uh, urbanized um, uh, populations, whereas we see them all the time in little pockets of hunter gatherers that still exist around the, the globe. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that the that the, the, the answer to you know fixing all the problems of the world would be to take those microbes and put them back into into uh, people in urbanized uh, lifestyles. There are also microbes that we now have in the urbanized world which we don't see in hunter gatherers. And a good example of that are um, you know certain members of the of a group called the bifidobacterium, which are known to be beneficial. Uh, those are not microbes that colonize hunter gatherers mm. except during early childhood. And yet no one would um, suggest that they're not beneficial microbes from the point of view that um, several of them have actually been used as probiotics and so under the right circumstances they might be. So I think we've got to be very careful about just sort of assuming that what was great for us once would be great for us again, if only we could go back to it and uh, you know replace missing microbes. I think we've just got to understand why the changes have happened, and perhaps our um, you know the human side of us needs to catch up with this very rapid evolution that's happened, and uh, perhaps you know that some of the metabolites that um, that were being made are now not being made, or we need uh, replacements for that. Um, I wanted to pick up on this 
debate about food additives. I mean, and I would agree that it's very important that we, you know, not eating at all is far worse for the microbiome than, uh, <laughs> than eating food that might be uh, tainted with some of these additives. With one clear example, I mean, it's a bit of a bugbear of mine is artificial colors because they have absolutely no nutritional value whatsoever. They're only there to make food pretty. And that is one area in which we could um, put some legislation in place to remove them from food. And I think that's been done quite successfully in the UK, mm. not in Canada. I find that the, the food in Canada is much more brightly colored. Uh, but we're very interested in azo dye, uh, azo food dyes, which are actually a, a byproduct and in some cases of the petroleum industry. And which we have found are uh, reduced by gut microbes, so they're metabolized by gut microbes, and they make compounds which are not very nice to human cells. And so, uh, so I do think that there's still some work to be done uh, in in looking at this in a in a pragmatic way. So yes, we do need to make food available to all, but we also need to understand that we want to try to make sure our microbes are as healthy as they can possibly be. Excellent. I think one question was from Karen Fluxman. Uh, she says, can you tell where someone lives based on their microbiome? And it was loved by another one. This question. Anyone? <laughs> no. <laughs> Short answer, no. <laughs> uh, but actually, yeah, I, it's I mean, really I, hard. I, I'm looking at the chat, and I think you, you've heard both James, Emma, and Peter emphasize that although intentionally changing your microbiome may be beneficial, it also may be detrimental. And I, you know, when you see comments in the chat that I need an FMT, I think it's important to remember people have picked up other diseases from FMTs, infections from FMTs. And so it's not a panacea for, unfortunately, for every ill. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And, I, and I, think, I think as well, um, it is also important to emphasize that although the documentary uh, that you've seen from Sharon is about a DIY FMT, um, but what we would really like to emphasize here is that you should not try this yourself. You should really consult a doctor and, um, and you know, learn more about the disease. But if the, your doctor is not, you know, uh, inspired by FMT, maybe get them a doctor who's inspired by an FMT and let them talk to them. So maybe um, you can add a little bit on that, um, Alan, on, um, you know, how to basically today, uh, you know, translate the science that we already know about the microbiome, like from an FMT perspective and so on, to help these patients that, as some of the chat had mentioned, suffering in silence. And what well, support think, can you give yeah, to these I people? think James emphasized it well, is that there is a big gap. There's a ton of data. You know, smart people like Peter and Emma are telling us lots of information about the microbiome in mice or in organoids. But when you go to a patient in the clinic, it's really hard to tell them from that, stop this and your microbiome will improve or do this and it will get better because uh, the human microbiome is... Um, it's not that minimal, it's just turning around very quickly because you've got disease X or disease Y. Um, but to your point, I mean, definitely find a physician or get an opinion on someone who's at least uh, open to the thoughts and interested in the research. And even if they can tell you, look, I can't fix this particular problem. I mean, James mentioned people coming with data sheets of here's my microbiome in 12 pages, what will I do? Um, they may not be uh, know how to fix it, but at least conscious of, okay, there's a disruption there. These are things we know may be beneficial, dietary changes, lifestyle changes, and so forth. Um, that's the first step, but there's a big gap to giving you drug X or Y to change your microbiome at this point, apart from C. diff. Just to add to that, I think if you're, if you're interested in changing your microbiome, you, quite well, in my clinical practice anyway, um, you need a team of people. You need a multidisciplinary team to really sustainably help fix someone's microbiome. And quite often that means a dietitian. So I have a dietitian that I work with and we try and use data and information to target nutritional interventions. So you've got to have a, a doctor that's really good with uh, communicating with a dietitian. I have a clinical psychologist because gut brain interactions are extremely important. Uh, and um, if nothing else, living with awful chronic disease has a psychological burden and it's very helpful to address that even if it doesn't. And, I, and I'm absolutely convinced that gut brain interactions are critical. You need to have, um, you know, you need to have physicians that talk to, uh, that, that, that are able to also talk, talk across speciality because quite often you need that multi uh, specialty input, particularly if you're thinking about FMTs. 
For us, if you come to an if you come to see me clinically in the UK, you can have an FMT for Clostridium difficile infection because it's approved and it's a you know we can do that. But actually, for anything else, you will only get it from me if you go into a clinical trial because it is experimental. We don't know uh, the, the the you know the true safety profile of some of these interventions. Uh, and it's better for you because you're going to be safer. It's better for me because we're going to learn. And it's better for the patient tomorrow because they're going to have data to have a more informed intervention with. So, so pick your clinician wisely. Uh, you know, definitely go through the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation if you've got UC or you've got Crohn's because they'll be able to point in the direction that you need to be. Uh, and I, I can just tell you that pretty much everyone here is pretty committed to translating you know, this exciting science into patient benefit as quickly as we can. And I'm afraid to say that is it's our last minute. Thank you so much uh, for your inspiring answers. And uh, I'm really happy to have had this chance to actually uh, moderate the session and discuss these questions with you. I'm really sorry for those who had asked questions. And I think there are a few that we haven't managed to answer there, sir. But we will try to get back to you, um, you know, in the next sessions uh, and so on. Um, I also finally would like to remind everyone that the designer sheet will be released in the general public on the November 14th uh, and is now available for a pre-sale on the designer sheet documentary.com and following the streaming platform in the US, Amazon, Apple TV and uh, Vimeo. Also, if you have enjoyed this panel, uh, please join us for other schedules throughout this month of November and you will be able to probably receive an email of that. Uh, they're all free of charge. You just come and learn and uh, maybe ask some questions. You have any worries and we'll be more than happy to answer you. Thanks again for joining us and uh, wish you a great evening or a great afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Nice <laughs> to meet Thank you. Yeah, thanks for doing this, I mean. <laughs> and Brenda. My pleasure. <laughs> nice to see you again, James. <laughs> nice to see you too. Good job. Nice meeting you in my teacher. Bye. Thanks. Bye.